Okay, we're back. We're live. This is really a special show. This is uh, History is Here to Help and How Putin's War uh, Affects European Politics. And, and how does it play in European, Europe's rising populism? Mm, I thought that was an American phenomenon, but I guess it could be anywhere. Uh, and of course, we have my co-host and contributor, Peter Hoffenberg. R raise your hand if you're Peter Hoffenberg. Excellent. I'll have, go, I'll have to go get him. I think he's okay, outside. Yeah, yeah, he's outside. Yeah. He's down uh, the okay. hall. And Manfred Hennigson. <laughs> he joins us. In. There, there it is. Raise your hand if you're Manfred. Okay, and, yeah, and Manfred yeah. is trying to look like a Vermeer painting, yeah. but he's, he's missing the pearl earring. I'm sorry about That's that. That's right. I missed yeah. miss that. <laughs> okay. Anyway, we're talking about a, a very important thing that is evolving, emerging, and, and the, the outlines of it are becoming more and more clear every day. So, Peter, uh, as you all want to do, can you first, can you tell us more about Manfred? I mean, the, the serious kind of discussion about Manfred and about the scope of our, our talk today. My pleasure. It's good to see you, Manfred. I, Manfred uh, is Professor Emeritus of Political Science at UH Manoa, where he has taught countless undergraduate and graduate students. His graduate students are spread far and wide. Uh, Manfred is a, a man of many interests and talents. Uh, I have very selfishly invited him today uh, to talk, as Jay suggested, uh, about the impact of the war and also more broadly about his studies of what we would consider the European right and populism in Europe. So I would like, uh, and I hope Jay agrees with me, to not just discuss the war with Manfred, but how he sees it in light of a longer arc of European populism and the European right. Uh, Manfred's uh, experiences are, are not just with travel, uh, but a tremendous amount of scholarship on what, for want of a better term, would be modern European uh, political thought, uh, regimes of tyranny, fear, the significance of memory as we rethink particularly World War II. So Manfred, good to see you. Love the shirt, very stylish as always. Uh, the way we work is I turn it over to my boss, Jay. Uh, he asks some questions, and then we have a pleasant half hour or so of back and forth. So Jay, let me turn it over to you. And Manfred, good to see you. Thank you. It's hard to say this conversation can be pleasant. We'll try to do what we can. But we, you know, we have Europe is, uh, Europe is in a state, isn't it? Europe has been jostled. This war is affecting the stability of Europe. Uh, before we even get to the politics, uh, it must be on the minds of most people on the street, and they must have a certain amount of anxiety. And that you know, goes further, doesn't it? That goes to this, this phenomenon of political uh, populism. Uh, t talk to me about the way this works. How does it insinuate, how does the war insinuate itself into the thinking of these various countries in Western Europe, and for that matter, Eastern Europe? Well, you see, the interesting thing about when, and Peter asked me whether I would like to talk about uh, European right wing populism, that was long before. Uh, the war started, uh, populism was in decline with the exception of uh, France, but in most other parts, it was not really moving up, uh, and especially not in Germany and in Scandinavia. Uh, I mean, what this invasion has done to Europe is in a way to beef up the EU identity. Now you have to you have to understand the motivation for the war uh, was to stop the incursion of Western liberalism into the Soviet in, in this, in, into Russia. Uh, the Ukraine was a threat. The Ukraine was, in a way, uh, the model. You know how Russia could become transformed. And there's one very important figure. Uh, who is Zelensky like, you know, like the president of the Ukraine, and that's Navalny. And uh, he is the most prominent uh, uh, opponent of Putin. He's in prison now, but, uh, you know, CNN uh, showed this incredible movie, uh, Canadian movie, uh, about Navalny. And when you watch it, you know, you understand why Putin is afraid. 
that the Ukraine becomes the model for transformation uh, of Russia. Now, I do not think one should exaggerate uh, that possibility because you have a lot of Russians who do not want to become liberalized uh, in the European or American sense. They are quite happy uh, with uh, this Eurasian vision that Putin has. You know, he wants to dis disconnect uh, Russia not only from all uh, global economic uh, connections, he wants, uh, in a way, to restore this identity, you know, that uh, in the late 19th century was promoted, you know, as the third Rome. Um, and, you know, it includes the, the, the Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox Church. Um, and, you know, they are behind Putin. You know, Putin is not only a Machiavellian uh, power politician, he is uh, spiritually, you know, deeply connected with uh, the Orthodox Church. And so it's a package to you, you know, of the Tsarists, Tsar Stalinists, uh, Great Russia connected with the Church. Uh, and that has nothing, you know, when you when you look at, and, and for, for him, the Ukraine was part of this package to you, but now, you know, he, he just, he realized that the Ukrainians did not want to become uh, part of this reinvention, you know, of this great Russian uh, uh, empire. And when you look at, you know, what is happening there, five million refugees have proven to Putin, you know, that they don't want to be part of his uh, empire. They, are, they have left uh, for uh, Poland, for, uh, for Hungary. There's one thing that I must admit, which really annoys me or doesn't annoy me, but uh, makes me a little bit nervous because what these refugees that are in Poland now, in Hungary especially, uh, have done is to beef up the uh, positive identity of these two countries, which attacked, you know, in a different way, the European Union by not abiding by, you know, all kinds of provisions uh, by undermining the uh, legal system, the court system, by doing all, by uh, being, you know, ideologically, uh, or calling themselves in a defender of a Christian white uh, Europe. So the critique that began to become very, very formidable in Western Europe against Poland and Hungary has now become somehow silenced. But that is something, you know, one cannot, uh, that, that has simply happened. Uh, and I do not know how uh, the European Union will come to, to terms with that. You know, they still have to deal with all kinds of money transfers uh, that are uh, connected with uh, the EU treaty to Hungary and to Poland, whether they will stop that curtailment, uh, I don't know. But in any case, what you have at this point, you could say uh, something that Putin, I don't think, anticipated that his invasion really uh, somehow revitalized, you know, the identity, the European identity, the political identity of the European Union. And it also, you know, may possibly lead to Finland and Sweden uh, joining NATO. I mean, the two prime ministers were yesterday in Berlin talking with uh, Chancellor uh, Scholz. And uh, so in that sense, you have there something that uh, really had, was not intended by Putin, uh, but it has, I think will have major consequences now. What the American 
part will be, you know, once we have the primary, uh, the, the midterm elections and then the 2024 election, God knows, you know, if Trump will come back into power um, and uh, revives his friendship with Putin, uh, then uh, Europe is left on its own. Uh, I don't know uh, how, what will happen. Uh, you know, none of us can predict how the midterms will go out. But I mean, the populism in the United States is worse than uh, it is in Europe, maybe with the exception of France, uh, you know, where you had 41% of Marie Le Pen, uh, Marine Le Pen uh, getting, and then, uh, I mean, half of, or more than half of the Republicans, you know, uh, are anti Biden and populist believing in the lie that Trump is still president. So overall, I don't know how the shape of the Western response to this challenge by Putin will, uh, will emerge, you know, over the next uh, year or so. Uh, but you will agree that it is in a state of transformation. Yes. Uh, that when you put these vectors together, you know, the the um, the threat of it and the refugees of it and the populism surfacing yet again. Um, when you put that all together, um, you have you have changes going on, changes, yeah, but, some of yes, which are but, visible and some of which are under right, the hood. Right. But you see, one thing that's very interesting, this populism is declining, especially in Germany. So, uh, you know, when you look at, when you compare France and Germany, in France, you had now 41% for Marie Le Pen. In Germany, the AfD is down to 10% and they are in the process of self-destruction. You know, they kill each other. Uh, they uh, are in a constant uh, civil war involved. So, and then you have, remember, you know, you have this very smooth transition from the macro, government uh, to Scholz and the Greens. And what you have now in Germany is the, the fascinating phenomenon that the Greens, who were the leaders of the pacifist movement in the 70s, are ahead of the Social Democrats in terms of, uh, you know, of providing the Bundeswehr, the military, with funds. You know, uh, they, uh, they have completely transform themselves and uh, isn't that because they want to be humanitarian isn't no, that because no. they are sympathetic well that's that's but there's a realism suddenly a political realism taking over in the greens that was not there in the 70s i mean when you think of petra kelly who was the icon you know of uh, the greens she came to hawaii a few times she was almost becoming a visiting professor in our department at one point. You know, Glenn Page uh, really uh, was promoting that. And she was a charismatic figure, but she was an anti-war person. Today, you have Anna, Annalena Baerbock, who is the German foreign minister. She is a Green. And Hab Jürgen Habermas, who just wrote published a really extraordinary essay about Scholz in the German newspaper Süddeutsche Zeitung, in which he praises his reticence, you know, his careful uh, uh, balancing of politics, of German politics. And he called her the icon, you know, of, uh, of German politics. Now, the energy minister who has to manage, you know, that this um, connection of uh, Germany, uh, the gas, the Nord, the, Nord, the Nord Stream pipeline. Yeah. Well, not only that. I mean, look, we have two. People didn't know they were two. The one that is still running now. Yes. Is Nord Stream one. Nord Stream two did not become activated. But this guy Habeck, who's uh, the co-chair of the Greens, together with uh, Baerbock. Uh, is as formidable, you know, in his uh, insistence of the transformation of the Green Party. Uh, and you see, the Social Democrats have still this lingering, uh, this lingering um, 
sympathy for uh, the Russia that uh, the Russia of Gorbachev that allowed the German unification to take place. They think of Willy Brandt's, uh, you know, Ostpolitik in uh, the 1970s. So you have a lot of emotional baggage, emotional political baggage. Uh, well, it, from a historical point of view, Peter, is, is there anything new here? You have emotional baggage, you have, um, you know, lots of political parties going on, lots of historical threads. Uh, isn't that Europe for the past hmm, hundreds of years? Well, that's the case always. Uh, yes, yes and no. Uh, so I'd like to take advantage of Manfred being here, uh, completely exploit his brilliance and experience by asking him to tease out uh, at least three of the very interesting points you made among all of them. Uh, for our audience in particular. Uh, one important point you made was that uh, however we think about Putin, uh, the two major consequences of the invasion seem not to have been on his radar. One is the surprisingly stiff and effective military resistance, which may in part be due to uh, poorly trained uh, Russian military. And secondly, what at least seems to be uh, the resurrection of NATO and the European Union. So the first question would be for our audience, uh, what does this tell us about Putin as a political leader? Uh, did he mis misjudge things? Was he uh, blinded by his own particular hubris? How do you think we can explain this? I think both. I think he was blinded by his uh, grandiose vision of uh, this resurrected uh, Russian empire, uh, and he was misinformed. Hmm. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, what is so extraordinary is that you could say the Western intelligence, especially American intelligence, were better informed about uh, the status of uh, the Russian military than Putin was. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the, the Americans knew almost anything before Putin got a hint. So it was, it's absolutely extraordinary, this, this uh, superiority of uh, the American intelligence in this particular, uh, in this event, you know, when you compare it with the mess of the Iraq war, how the US got into, you know, the, the Iraq war in 72. This is completely different and absolutely stunning uh, how, uh, not only well, primarily American, but other Western intelligence services also succeeded in anticipating almost every move uh, that the Russians were making or trying to make. And then you have this incredible mess, you know, that they created for themselves, uh, the Russians. And whether Putin will be able, you know, of uh, replenishing uh, the military uh, personnel, you know, in U in the Ukraine is questionable. I mean, I realized for the first time in my life how big the Ukraine is in 2016 when I went, you know, from Lviv to Kiev to Odessa, you know, by train. Absolutely stunning. I mean, I had no idea uh, Ukraine is as big as Russia. Uh, I mean. <laughs> And how, with this rundown military uh, army that he has, conventionally, I do not think he could <laughs> occupy, uh, occupy uh, the Ukraine. But uh, for that reason, you know, the fear that he will use chemical weapons, biological weapons, and maybe even nuclear weapons um, is uh, always there. You know, if he has no other way of uh, holding on to it, you know, and next week he wants to celebrate uh, the victory, uh, you know, on the 9th of May, you have always these victory parades in Moscow uh, uh, being, you know, the victor of World War II. Um, you know, Mariupol, I mean, the, the, the total destruction of Mariupol will be <laughs> the symbol that he will use. That uh, seems to be compelling them to demolish the city as soon as possible. I think right. May, May right. 9th on his schedule, and I would expect the steel factory to be destroyed yes. entirely by May 8th. Uh, secondly, because I mean, we would love to have, 
The pink no, no, but the day before, I expect yes, the, okay. the steel, steel, steel factory and yes. um, uh, God only knows what's going to happen to the wounded soldiers. Uh, we only have a few minutes left, so I really want to exploit you for our audience. The second, uh, I think, very interesting point you made, which doesn't get a lot of coverage here, is the tension between, let's say, the more orthodox EU, Germany, France, the more orthodox, and these uh, two strategically significant countries, uh, Poland and Hungary. So could you help our audience just in a, in a few sentences tell us, for example, about the, the legal battle, how the EU does require uh, a European-wide legal system, which the Poles and Hungarians seem to be uh, pushing back against. Right. And uh, I mean, this is uh, part, you know, also you could say of the ideo ideological discourse that especially Viktor Orban, mm -hmm. the prime minister of Hungary, uh, promotes, but uh, law and justice, you know, the party, Kaczynski's party in, in Poland does the same thing, you know. Uh, they are, in one respect, you could say, in line with Putin by being against uh, the liberal West. You know, Viktor Orban is always talking about uh, the virtues of illiberal democracy. Um, and, well, that's what they have been practicing, you know, that he became re-elected uh, with a great majority recently is sad. But then on the other hand, you have this lovely defeat of the uh, Orban clone in uh, Slovenia, you know, he was defeated in elections. But then you have this scary scenario of, of France. I mean, a country that is almost divided uh, along line of whether Macron is capable of containing his arrogance and uh, you know, be, open himself up to all of the problems that he was unwilling to deal with uh, in the first five years of his in the, in the first presidency. I don't know. You see, well, you know, Manfred. I, one one thing is that um, I think Putin is counting on the ultimate um, deterioration of the coalition. How long can it stay in place? Which coalition? Uh -huh. The Western European coalition. Oh, I think it has become it has become so f formidable, uh, especially in the European Union. Even Hungary and Poland, I think, um, being overwhelmed by these refugees, you know, will recognize that. So, if there's one positive thing that has come out of it, it's the <coughs> the strengthening of the European Union. No, Will it stay strong uh, if the yes. Republicans win in November and win in 2024 and, and uh, Trump, uh, you know, ac 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 ascends to more power? Uh, or will that undermine it and cause it to fragment? I do not think it will cause it to fragment. I think it will cause it um, to finally do what um, Macron had suggested for a long time, namely to get a military dimension for to the European Union. Um, so I think um, people have um, realized, you know, the threat in Finland, especially, you know, Finland is member of NATO and the EU. Sweden is uh, only member of the EU, it's not member of NATO. And these fractured Scandinavian countries, you know, especially monarchies, the three monarchies, Sweden, Norway and Denmark, uh, they will be, I think, uh, becoming more European and get rid of their Ure and crowns, uh, not of their, of their kings and queens, but uh, I mean, it's a little bit pathetic, you know, when you, when you go to Denmark and you can, cannot use the Euro, you know, you have to use the crowns and Ure, and sometimes they don't even accept the Euro, everywhere else they do. Uh, but this pathetic nationalism, this nostalgia, you know, that you have. Um, and, uh, you know, and uh, Applebaum in her Twilight of Democracy makes that as a, develops that as a major argument. This nostalgic uh, attempt, you know, to return to a past that is 
not that evil. You saw that in Brexit. I mean, that was part of Brexit as well. Brexit. Uh, look, and and in both cases, in the in the French and the Amer in the in the British case, you know, you have this his, this historical nostalgia that the, the Brexit, you know, returned Britannia, and in the French case, uh, la grande nation, uh, and it, happily, you know, you could say one of the results of the German defeat um, by Western powers and the Soviet Union in 1945 is that this vision does not exist in Germany. So you have there of the three major European countries, one that does not suffer from nostalgia. And uh, I think that is something that people do not really uh, recognize enough how important that is that you have the, the most economically most powerful and the largest country in the center of Europe not being um, deluded by uh, a vision of, 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 of a nostal nostalgic vision of returning to a past. Mm. What about anti-Semitism, Manfred? That's one of the elements in our discussion today. There's a, there's, um, you know, a, there's a, an, I guess it's an emergence uh, of anti or reemergence of anti Semitism. How does that play with all of this? How does well, it play with the coalition? I think anti Semitism is not the center, it's part of the package of the ideological package of the populism. But you see, I mean, anti Semitism is, uh, you could say, almost worse in this country. You have over 2,700 cases in 2021. Um, and I think uh, the American anti-Semitism is more of the traditional um, type, whereas in the European case, you have the presence of Muslims. Um, you know, you have um, close to 10 million Muslims in France. You have uh, 4 million Turks in Germany. Uh, half of them are German citizens, the other half didn't want to become German citizens because they would lose their property rights in Turkey. But then you have, since 2015, one million Syrians and others. But you see, the interesting thing about this, how European societies have responded to this uh, migration influx is, that, uh, and that is not recognized enough <clears throat> either. <clears throat> the integration of the Syrians into Germany um, is in the labor market. 10,000 of the young um, Syrians are studying now German universities. Uh, what you have there is not this ideological overhang of the replacement argument that you have also in the United States, you know, that uh, non-whites are beginning to replace uh, uh, the, the core of uh, European white, the, the European white core of uh, Western societies. That played a role in the French election uh, not only Le Pen, but uh, the, the other guy, the more radical guy from Algeria, you know, made this as an argument. But you had that also uh, in Britain. You know, the Brexit uh, six, 2016 was, well, interestingly enough, not caused by what Merkel did in Germany, you know, that uh, she let the one million uh, Middle Eastern people come in. Uh, no, it had to do with the with the in migration of uh, people from Romania, from Bulgaria, you know, from Poland, uh, over a million, close to two million people were working in Britain uh, who were not who were not uh, non-Europeans. They were Europeans, and they had the 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 permission, you know, to travel because that's part of the the EU. Uh, uh, constitutional framework. And you also have uh, hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians before the invasion 
moving around in uh, working in uh, EU countries because uh, the EU granted them in 2019 uh, visa-free entry into uh, the European Union. So the, for me, the interesting thing is, you know, when I was in Berlin this December, uh, in restaurants, uh, you don't find any uh, German waiters. You know, you have, it's, it's, and when you drive at night, you know, through the city, you see all these re huge Turkish uh, vegetable markets. Uh, it's absolutely stunning, you know. Uh, it, it has, uh, it's, and a credit, it's a credit to Germany, isn't it? Yes. That they have accepted this kind of diversity. But let me, let me switch for one last point of discussion, Manfred. And you mentioned before, you know, that a lot of people in Russia are okay with this war. And that may be because of the propaganda, Russian yes. TV and all that. No, no, absolutely. Yes. But, you know, so we have, we have definite points of transition of, um, of change in Western Europe uh, in terms of migration, in terms of, you know, the, the political implications of what's happening country by country. But in Russia, is there a similar process going on? Are these people, and there are a lot of people we read, are leaving Russia? They're uh, opposing the war, protesting the war by leaving. Uh, there are a lot of people who are afraid to speak out on it because they'll go to jail. But under the hood, from a political science point of view, is Russia also involved in change because of Putin's war? That is not clear. Um... You know, it seems in the polls that his approval ratings have become better after the invasion and that the exodus of uh, people from Russia are the exodus of uh, scientists, of, uh, you know, professionals uh, who will have no problems finding jobs uh, in the U.S. or in any of the major Western European countries. Uh, I mean, this exodus will will bleed uh, Russia in the future. I mean, this is like uh, the exodus of uh, the Jews from Germany, you know, in 1930, from 1933 to 1938. Um, I mean, look at the uh, statistics of Nobel Prize winners, you know, American Nobel Prize winners and their origin, you know, where they, many of them came from. Uh, and the same thing, you know, will happen uh, to Russia. So Putin, the stupidity of Putin, you could say, uh, becomes manifest, you know, in the unwillingness to recognize what he is doing to his own society. Now, I do not know whether Navalny, I mean, I don't know whether you have seen the Navalny film. If you have not, get show it, watch it. It's really stunning. And he, at the end, you know, he's asked, what do you think we should do if they kill you? Now, they will not kill him because if they kill him, that would be the signal for, uh, you know, protests in, in Russia. But he, he may die, you know, and he said, when he was asked, what should we do, his friends? He said, do not give in. Meaning, if I die, that should be the signal for you to continue the work that I have been trying to do. And I mean, when you watch this, when you watch this documentary, it's a stunning, uh, it's a stunning work of um, political um, analysis, and you have there, you know, the Russian Zelensky. And you remember, Zelensky, you know, was an actor, and then in, in his one of the last shows, you know, he played the president, and then he became that president. Now, Navalny is not an actor, but I mean, why he, why he returned to Russia from Berlin when he, you know, when they discovered that he had been poisoned is, uh, well, that is the same kind of the quality of courage that uh, Zelensky shot. But in that movie, you know, there is a sub movie, there's a, there's a plot 
when Navalny and his wife, Yulia, and uh, friends, they are trying to find out who was responsible for the poison. And the, in the end, they discover this guy. You know, he reveals everything on a phone call. And when you watch that, <coughs> it's absolutely hilarious on the one side. On the other hand, it also shows the stupidity, you know, of the regime uh, that they really thought they could get away with it to kill Navalny, the most prominent opponent of Putin in Siberia by you know, poisoning his underwear uh, and description of that. I mean, you have simply to laugh when you, when you listen to that phone conversation because he wants to know what part of my underwear did they, and then they talk you know, about the part. And if he would not have been if the plane would not have landed in in Tomsk, you know, and there you got they got the permission to transfer him to Berlin, uh, we would never have found out. Mm. But the stupidity, wow. nevertheless, is is obvious. Mm. Peter, we're almost out of time. Uh, I wonder if you could um, um, close. Uh, ask uh, Manfred, um, you know, the overarching question that may be in your mind. Uh, and in any event, summarize and ultimately to thank him for this great discussion. Well, there's one thing that I wanted to tell you when you asked me about uh, Putin uh, in Russia. You know, I have here the newest issue of foreign affairs. There's an article in which uh, the most recent uh, ratings are mentioned. And it says Putin's ratings plunged after a controversial 2018 reform raising the retirement age from 60 to 65 for men from 58 to 63. Uh, and it plunged uh, to be into the 30s from 59 mm. percent. You know, in, but that was before the invasion. Yeah. Uh, well, OK. I mean, uh, there may be something happening under the hood. That's we right. We should be watching to see. Yes you know, indications of that going yes. forward. No, absolutely. Peter? Well, thank you very much, Manfred. Appreciate your insights as always. And I think our audience can go away with a, a few takeaways. Jay always likes me to give a couple and then to end with a question. So I think among the important takeaways that you've suggested to us is the way in which this war has interacted with a larger sense of Europe and how the war, in fact, uh, unbeknownst, or you know, may, maybe Putin realized it, uh, has reinforced a sense of NATO and reinforced a sense of the European Union, which could include adding countries, as you suggested. Uh, but you've raised the important question of uh, once the war is over, what will be left? And I think if I'm hearing you, uh, the strengths will continue. Perhaps the un uh, unanimity will not, but Europe, Europe itself is stronger and will endure in that way. Uh, you reminded us that uh, Europe, for better or worse, is in somewhat of a relationship with the US. So part of the answer for the future of post-war uh, Europe will be the role of the United States. I don't think any of us envision a second Marshall Plan, uh, but it does seem that there is enough consistency in Congress to continue. Um, I'd like to have you back to talk more explicitly about populism and the right. Um, you've hinted at it, and I think there's probably a, a lot more there. Uh, I would only add that I think much of uh, the future depends upon uh, Europe's commitment to breaking away from this uh, petrol state. I mean, it's all the discussion of Russia and its revenue and Putin's power uh, does require a significant exporting of oil and natural gas. And I think a, me a measure of Europe's fortitude will be whether uh, it will in fact move away from that kind of dependence, which will though put the Green Party in an interesting situation because moving away from natural gas and oil is going to mean, as we've already seen, the resurrection of nuclear power, domestic nuclear power. So from a political economy point of view, I think uh, Europe's energy future is not just of significance for the climate and for Europe itself, but really whether or not uh, Putin's state can continue. It requires the revenue from that. So uh, let me invite you back at some point. 
uh, we, do not, we do not know how the war will end. I don't think anybody knows how it will end other than its devastation to Ukraine. That, that can't be denied. Um, and so thank you very much. And we will see you after, maybe after your next visit, you can come back and give us an update about the way things are. So, Man uh, Manfred Henningsen, um, Peter Hoffenberg, this has been a great discussion. Thank you so much, Manfred, Peter. I appreciate it. Uh, yes, and we will circle back. Thank you so much. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.